Hi, welcome to AmateurLogic.tv episode 35. I'm George. The Christmas episode. I'm Jim. And I'm Tommy. Ho, ho, ho. And I'm Peter, and it's sort of like Christmas down here, but upside down. What's, what's the temperature like down there, Peter? Honestly, today is absolutely beautiful. Um, no clouds in the sky, about, um, well, we do it all in Celsius, but let's say 20 degrees Celsius at the moment. Absolutely perfect with the weather I absolutely love. Well, Jim, how would that convert to Fahrenheit? I'm thinking like 72. Is... 72, so close to what we had here today. Yeah. Mm. We were yeah. just under that. Yeah, so it wasn't sunny. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's perfect Christmas weather for, you know, going out and having a barbecue. Got a lot of big emails lined up, don't we? Yeah. It's, even though it's only been, what, how long has it been since About last? a month. Yeah. About a month. Yeah, we've got... Uh, We've got we've had a lot of response from our last episode. Haven't yeah, we? we've had uh, pretty good numbers on it. A lot of uh, Facebook posts and uh, more people joining that group. Yeah, and we've also got a, a, a group page on Google Plus now, but still figuring out exactly how to work that. You can't the group members. Uh, I, I can't see how they can yeah. post to it. I mean, yeah. it it doesn't look like they can. I know one of the biggest topics that we've had. Um, uh, a resp our biggest response on was about the uh, Radio Shack yeah. stuff. Yeah, and I've got an email here from Vincent on just that subject. He said he saw one of our videos where we talked about Radio Shack with regard to what customers wanted to see returned to the store. And as we had said, Arduino was uh, number one on the list. And he says it looks like they might actually come through on the promise. And he sent me a couple of links there showing that Radio Shack is selling Arduino products now. And you know, I went by the local store. I was here. about to say they had the Arduino Mega in stock, but uh, they they didn't have the cheaper ones like I was looking for. So I may just have to go back and uh, pick up that Mega here. After I Christmas. looked at the Uno online, if that's how you say it. I haven't ordered it yet, but it's the right price, and I like it. Yeah. Speaking of uh, experimenter type stuff, Peter, have you got a something there on the subject yeah i uh, came across well while well, surfing the internet i came across a new wi-fi mode called uh, zigbee and it interested me because they were claiming a greater range than your normal wi-fi in fact 1.5 kilometers which is a bit over a mile at one milliwatt so uh, that'd be line of sight and so it interested me. Um, I, I, I put a post on the Facebook page about it and got a few replies back, but generally um, most people didn't know very much about it. Uh, but Nick uh, mentioned that uh, it was used in the smart metering industry. So, uh, you know, if it, if, if it has that longer range, it uh, could, be, could be worthwhile for uh, testing and uh, over longer distances. Yeah, what I read about it uh, didn't really indicate longer range to me, and it, it was a lower data rate, so I'm not really sure. I, I, I see a lot of activity. The Zigbee you know. stuff's been around for a yeah. long time, and it's, you know, a highly recognized name, but I haven't read up on any of that wireless yeah. stuff. But speaking of wireless, we also got an email uh, from David. Actually, I say email, it's Facebook post, as we were talking about, and uh, David says he keeps coming back to wanting to learn Morse code. And I know a lot of amateurs do that. And he's saying he's you, you know tapping his figures out on his desk, but that's getting kind of old. He's ready to get a paddle, and he's heard that it's best to start with an iambic paddle, but he's saying they're all like way expensive, and there's a lot of truth to that. Iambic paddle is the way to go, David. You've got the two levers, and you're really going to want that if you ever get into CW really but well. Should you learn with an iambic, Actually, or should you I learn do. with a straight I would, key? I, I, you know, I've kind of have um, kind of mixed feelings about it, but overall, I would say the iambic paddle is the way to go. You can always learn how on a straight key. That is the generally recognized standard, but Man, if you're ever going to get any speed to it at all, you got to switch over to IAMI. And he was asking for advice on uh, where to find an inexpensive one. He said he was looking at the MFJ 564B. Excellent product. If you really want to save some money, they're about $60 US. The look at the 561. It's only 22 bucks. It's an it's still an iambic, 
it's a portable set of paddles but it would do to learn on and you could save some money if you weren't sure you were really going to hang with it but uh, by the way best way to learn CW get something to listen to it's good to send practice your sending but you gotta be able to you listen know, we had a uh, post on Facebook about uh, an interesting topic about Linux which is uh, kind of hit close to home for me this week you'll see why shortly but anyway, Andy's uh, waiting on his radios to come in. He had a post on there that says, while I'm waiting for my radios, I was thinking about putting a ham radio Linux live CD or USB together. But I need to know what's the average power of a ham shack PC. Put your specs here. <clears throat> oh, yeah. I and mean. that's a very, I mean, that's everything from bleeding edge all the way to dinosaur. I've been following old Andy with a lot of interest there. Lynn DX, I think, is the name he settled on finally. And uh, I'm um, anxious to see that project come to fruition. Yeah, he's, he's got a good head of steam built up mm -hmm. there. That's, yeah, that's going to be pretty interesting to follow. Yeah, it would be great to have a Linux distribution that is specifically targeted at ham radio operators because um, there's apparently plenty of software out there uh, that uh, runs on Linux that uh, could be incorporated into that package. If you're not a member of the Facebook group, go sign up and go put in your PC specs there that you use in your shack. And if you are, uh, go on by there and put yours in as well. It'd be really interesting to see uh, what people are using nowadays. Yeah, especially if you're using a slow one. Let yeah. us know about that. Right. And speaking of <clears> Linux... <throat> yeah, man. Uh, I've, uh, you know, I've got that old Windows PC that's been sitting in my corner forever. I've been Every once in a while, I try to kick it, kick start it, and uh, fire it back up. And uh, I got a wild hair to, to tackle that thing. And uh, let me show you what I'm doing with it. Hi, it's been a lot of talk on the uh, Amateur Logic Facebook group about Linux. We've had several emails about it too, where people want to know a little more information. It's a little daunting to try something totally new like that, worried about trashing your computer or whatever. I've got an old machine here that I've had sitting here and I do a little bit with it every now and then but it's slow and, and it's outdated and it won't support Windows 7 so I'm going to put Linux on it and breathe a little bit of life back into it maybe I can have fun with that thing Lord knows it's not worth anything anymore so I may as well try I don't have much to lose Linux has come a long way from when it first came out obviously <laughs> so kind of a no-brainer statement but the installers are great. There's a lot of support for all kinds of different hardware. Um, if you want a dual boot where you can run Windows or have an alternate to choose to run and uh, run Linux, you can do that. Um, we've got a different solution we're going to try here shortly where there's no risk. You, if you don't like it, you just delete it and you, your computer's back the way it was when you started. Let's go ahead and dig in and take a look. DistroWatch.com is a cool site. It's got a lot of Linux information on it. All the information on the latest releases, changes, news, uh, anything newsworthy affecting any of the distros. We'll take a look at the, the drop down here that shows distros. And uh, these are the ones that they have news articles for. And you can see there are literally hundreds of them. And there are a lot of them that uh, aren't even on here. We're going to look at Linux Mint. People on the Amateur Logic Facebook group have been talking a lot about it, and I just want to try it. I've got this old machine. I want to put something on it, breathe a little new life into it. It's a little slow for what I normally do. So I'm going to give it a go. I came over here, and I already downloaded Linux Mint 12, which is hot off the press. And I've got the ISO sitting here. Um, it's, it's documented very nicely. If you, you may want to grab the user guide here. To help you along with the install but it's it's honestly very straightforward as you'll see in a few minutes I'm going to install in a virtual machine I, I like doing that you can boot from the CD and play around with it and the performance is a little bit better but I'm going to go with the virtual machine for one reason I can show you the screen uh, easier and I just like that because as I'm playing around with it, if I get in the middle of something and I need to leave, I can actually save the state of that machine to my disk, to my hard drive on my computer. And when I fire it back up, I'm right where I left off. Just like the technology in your laptop, when you close the lid, uh, it goes to sleep and you can wake it back up by opening the lid and continue where you left off. So I'm going to use uh, VirtualBox 
It's at virtualbox.org. Uh, Oracle actually bought this. I believe it was started by Sun. I've downloaded the latest uh, build of it, and I've already installed it on my computer to try to save some time. So let's spin it up. Uh, VirtualBox. It's a little bit sluggish uh, the first time you run it because it's building the uh, hard drive space. So we'll just kind of rip through this real quick. And you can pick the operating systems you want to run on it. If you got one of these, then uh, it's a little customized for that. But I'm just going to pick a generic Linux 2.6. <clears throat> uh, allocate how much memory. I've got 2 gigs in this thing, so I'm going to give it half of it. Linux runs pr very well on uh, on 1 gig of RAM. Obviously, more is better, but this is usable. Yeah, I'm going to create a new disk file. And we'll use the VirtualBox image since that's nat native. I'm going to go with dynamically allocated disk space. What this is, is when it starts off with a small file, and as you add things to your Linux OS, install applications and so forth, the, the size of the file on your host computer, Windows here, in my instance, is going to get larger as you do that. But you're not going to go ahead and just wipe out, you know, 100 gigs of your space or whatever you decide to use off the top now that said the performance is better but this old computer doesn't have that much space in it so i'm going to do this just to keep my space at a premium and decides to do it at eight gigs but i'm gonna go ahead and run it on up some let's do uh let's just here i'll just type in a hundred make a 100 gig that's how that's where the limit will be i'm going to start off with a small file which is your disk, uh, essentially. And it'll grow up to 1 gig before it says it runs out of space. Create it. Let's go. Okay. And it's pretty well ready. Okay, well, let's boot it up. And boom, we have no OS. So let's mount. I actually have this... Uh, ISO on my computer that I downloaded from the Linux Mint site and it will mount that. Now it thinks that's installed in a CD drive and let's reboot. And there it is. So I'm going to hit enter, see what the menu options are. You can start in compatibility mode, you can check your DVD, so forth. Usual stuff. If you have uh, Special command parameter, command line type parameters that you want to start the OS with. You can hit the tab and actually edit those. But I'm just going to take the defaults for right now. And it's loading. It's going to take a few moments. Okay, now we're running Linux Mint. And it looks very clean. It's a nice uh, UI. Click on applications and you've got uh, different things you can do. And... You can play around with this thing and uh, see if you want to use it. I'll be honest with you, I played with it earlier and I kind of liked it. So I actually want to put it on my VM uh, semi-permanently and use it for a week or so and see if I like it. Then I will uh, follow these instructions. I'll boot from the disk, follow the same instructions that I'm going to do to install it and install it on my uh, computer permanently. Okay, I'm, I ran uh, install Linux Mint. From the desktop and when you run this uh, outside of the virtual machine you're going to see uh, a really big speed improvement over running it here and be honest your computer probably has more resources than this one I, I built this machine back about eight years ago i put good parts in it and stuff it was top-notch machine at the time but it's very very dated now okay just follow the instructions and i chose english Oh yeah, we got that co covered. Okay, we're going to pick this. Uh, I'm just going to let it do the install for me. There's nothing on here. It's a clean machine. That's the only one that it sees, which is the one we built. And let's do the install.
Okay, where are we? We are right in the central time zone. Good enough. English keyboard. I guess we speak English down here in the south. My name. Uh, that's good enough. Pick a password. Only fair. It'll have to do. I like how it appears to be multitasking. It was setting up the drive and everything before while we were still filling in information and it's copying files down there. All right, now we get to sit back and watch the slideshow until the install is complete. We made it. It took a while. It took about... Uh, two and a half hours, three hours from start to finish. But this, this is a slow computer, like I said. Um, it downloaded a lot of language files. I'm not sure what language this thing speaks, but it's uh, heavy duty. So, if installation finished, we can continue running the uh, live CD. Or we can restart. And let's do that, because that's what we're going through all this for. Okay, we are booted up and we're running Linux Mint inside of our virtual box, virtual computer. And here's some things we can do. Ex get to this point, explore, have a good time. Let's we'll see if we can get on the internet. Right out of the box, it al it's already working with my network. I can get on the internet. Um, this is great. Go out to uh, Google somewhere and search for ham radio software for Linux, and you'll find G-Rig that you can control your rig with uh, if it's supported. There are quite a few that are supported. Man, there's just tons and tons of Linux software out there. Get VirtualBox. It's free. Give it a try. Try several distros. Um, there are a lot of them out there. Most of them look very different. Uh, basically run do the same thing. Uh, there's a lot of great ham software out there. Once I settle on a distro for my computer, I will uh, download several packages and we'll go over some of those in a future segment. It, hams are typically experimenters and uh, Linux is typically an experimenter type uh, operating system. So give it a try. Well, Tommy, you know, I've, I've been a little hesitant to do too much playing with Linux on my main box here. And this makes me feel... A little just, bit better. Just a not, little bit. not you, George. Yeah, I'll <laughs> Man, you're the experimenter's experimenter. I figured. <laughs> Tommy, uh, I just mentioned, uh, and for the viewers uh, out there as well, if you've got a really older box, um, what I suggest you do is run Puppy Linux, which is an extremely small and lightweight uh, Linux distribution that can uh, run very well on older, uh, o older boxes. And has been around for a good while itself. Cool. Good advice. Well, I've got another email here, and this one came from our friend David, VE7CQY. And he said, for the life of me, I can't remember where I saw you use Silver Compound to rub on a PC board. <laughs> What's the name of that stuff, and where do you buy it? Uh, that was a sort of an obscure reference to it in there. I think the only place that you've actually ever seen me use that on camera was when I built the Cantina. And for the little copper element on the inside, I uh, used a little silver plating compound on it just to um, you know, uh -huh. keep the, uh, the copper from tarnishing. And the name of that stuff was Cool Amp. And you can find it at cool-amp.com. 
George has a lot of little tricks <laughs> like that up his sleeve, and uh, I'm oftentimes having to come back and say, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute, now what is that, and where did you get that, and how do I get that? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, speaking of uh, people building things and uh, maybe a little solder involved, what have you got there, Peter? Well, I uh, received an interesting little box from England uh, just recently, and this is it here. And inside the box is this. Uh, it's a field strength meter, and it only consists of a meter and a couple of components. So I thought, just to pr show you that this actually works, watching, there you go. See? So, uh, yep, it does work. And this came from uh, Robert. Uh, let's get his uh, call sign here. Robert Mike Whiskey 3. Oscar Sierra India in Swansea in the UK. Thanks Robert. Um, he's also provided me with a number of other circuits for field strength meters so that's a possibility we might do something uh, with that either uh, building a field strength meter uh, or perhaps uh, using one to actually tune an antenna because uh, a an, uh, field strength meter like that can uh, be used to uh, tune a two meter antenna on your car uh, or at home. So yeah thanks very much Robert. Boy, that's really nice there, Peter. Uh, that was really nice of Robert to just send you that. Boy, yeah. Yeah, when are ours arriving? Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. <laughs> hey, I've got some uh, uh, homebrew stuff. I got a, I got a homebrew message here from old uh, JH. Uh, actual call sign is KD5GBC, otherwise known as JH. Or James. Or James. And JA writes uh, uh, to us that. Uh, He's just become a full-fledged general class, and so he's looking around for inexpensive uh, QRP, QRP homebrew kits, and uh, wanted to know what we would recommend. And boy, there they are. There are a lot. Sure are. And so Ooh. it's hard to focus in on just one. Of course, you've you've got. And he even said he didn't really want to go the uh, Elecraft route right now, which basically have become snapped together modules. You don't even have to solder anymore. Yeah, that's really not a kit. Yeah, to me. and that's what yeah. he was saying. And so uh, there's just so many. Uh, I recommend that what you do, James, is go get on the QRP-L mailing list. Just just go. You can go do a search. We'll put the link up here for you, but you can get on the QRP-L mail or mailing list and they those guys that get on there they talk about QRP day in day out all the time they've got a fact you can look through it they're going to list all the manufacturers for you and you can ask questions and really get it tailored down to exactly what you're looking for whether that's you know you can do SDR now everything from just a solid crystal rock to whatever you like well I've got an email here from uh, Tom KC0KEK -E says, uh, Tommy, I discovered Amateur Logic about a year ago. Great program. I really appreciate the work you, George, Jimmy, and Peter put into it. Also appreciate that you make the episodes available for download on uh, iTunes. Convenient for watching on iPad. Absolutely. <clears throat> oh, yeah. For a few episodes, you were living in Missouri. I'm curious which town you were in. He, he lives in Columbia, he says. And uh, sounds as if I travel quite a bit for work. And that's very true. If you're ever back in the area, maybe you could do a video tour of the Glen Martin factory in Boonville. He enjoyed the one for MFJ. Hey! And, uh, that's, a, that's a great idea. Um, I'd have to try to work it out where I could be up there a little bit more often, or a little bit longer stretch of time, because usually I fly in and go straight to where I've got to work and do what I've got to do and, and go home. But uh, it's possible I could work it out. I go yeah. up there about two two, three times a year sometimes. So I'll be hollering at you if I get back up there and can work that out. Yeah, Tommy is our workhorse uh, <laughs> traveler of the crew. Uh, we've got him going all over the United States. Uh, he's in New York one week mm -hmm. and Alabama the next. Mm -hmm. You never know where he's going to be. traveling correspondent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> There's going to be a mini maker fair here in Melbourne in the middle of uh, January. And what I'll do is I'll send George the link, which he'll put up hopefully now, uh, and you can go and find some further details about that. But entry is free, but you've got to book ahead. So 
I reckon this is going to be really cool. Um, it's sort of like hacker space, if you like. Uh, interesting building of um, rep wraps and things like that. So that really, really cool. That is also, the link is up right now on our Facebook page too, is it not, Peter? Oh, yep. I believe it is. I believe it is. So look, well is worth sure? uh, uh, checking out. Uh, anyway, um, I was going to build a shortwave regenerative receiver for this episode, but Murphy intervened and uh, I was uh, had to delay that a little bit. So I decided to go and um, do a, a Cantenna segment because um, I've always admired uh, the Cantenna that you guys built back in the, uh, the third episode. And uh, here it is, the Australian Cantenna. And basically, it's very similar to uh, what uh, uh, to to the um, uh, the one you guys built. So anyway, here's the segment that explains how to build it, and we go out and do some on-field uh, testing. Hello, everyone. Today we're going to build a cantenna, and not just any cantenna. We're going to build the Australian cantenna. To start off, you're going to need a couple of cans and uh, the cans need to be 3.26 uh, inches wide which is about 83 millimeters these were dog food cans and as you can see i've already used them uh, for my cantenna this can uh, here has uh, had one end cut off it and the other end is just left in place this can has had both ends cut off it and the idea is that we're going to extend the can out like so and uh, that will actually give us a, a 3 dB better result than just this can alone. The other thing we need to do is to drill a hole approximately uh, 17 millimeters wide which is about three quarters of an inch and that needs to be 2.46 inches from the bottom and the center of that needs to be 2.46 inches from the bottom which is about 63 millimeters and uh, we're going to put our female end connector in there. We're now going to make the driven element uh, for the cantenna. This is a female end connector and if you don't know the difference between a male connector and a female connector I suggest you ask your parents. What you then need to do is to go down to your local um, model aircraft shop and you can buy some of these tubes which are either made out of brass or copper I'm not quite sure and you want to find one that will fit snugly over the end of the end connector and then get another piece which is just one size smaller and will slide uh, snugly inside uh, this first tube and you want to get a couple of pieces which can be adjusted to uh, a length of approximately 31 millimeters that is 1.21 um, inches long. This tip was given to me by uh, Peter Cossens, uh, VK3 BFG, and uh, the whole idea of this is you're able to actually adjust the length of the antenna, and using a program like NetStumbler uh, with a wireless dongle, uh, you can actually tune the antenna for whatever actually works best. But failing that, just make the whole thing 31 millimeters long or 1.21 inches and you should do pretty fine with that. Once you've done that, uh, just solder it there and there with a little bit of care because the plastic here can melt uh, and you should be okay. My female end connector antenna is now mounted inside the can. The first thing I need to do is get an end connector to SMA um, uh, connector adapter and that will screw on like so and then you need one of these this is an EDUP wireless adapter which you can buy off the internet it's a wireless adapter but it has an SMA connector on the end and what we want to do is connect that to that SMA to SMA now in an ideal world I'd have the appropriate little brass connector like this that would go on to that and also go on to that so the whole thing would connect up neatly thus uh, allowing for minimum loss unfortunately I don't have that today but what I can do is use this little adapter pop that on there like so and then use this pigtail to connect from there over to there
all I need now is a USB cable to go from there to my laptop and I'm ready to roll. Uh, the final thing will be to pop the other can on the end here and then duct tape that around. Okay, we're here at our first test point to see how far we can get with our cantenna. Up there is Mount Dandenong, which is where all our TV transmitters are located. And there's also a, a node somewhere up there of the Melbourne Wireless Group. And that in turn, that group is in turn connected into the internet. So with a little bit of the use of my antenna, hopefully I should be able to get some free internet and also demonstrate uh, the range of the antenna. And there's the antenna over there, and all extended with my EPC ready to go. Now I've already aligned uh, my antenna, and just down the bottom here you can see GHO South Melbourne. And if I come over here, with a little luck, you can see that the signal strength is about minus 75 dB, which is not brilliant, but, but usable. And what we're going to do is I'm going to just show you the results of a Optus speed test that I've just done. And there you go. Um, 978 kilobits per second. Um, that's the download speed. And 24 kilobits per second upload speed with a ping time of 45 milliseconds. So um, that's not bad. It's not broadband, uh, but uh, it's more than dial-up. So uh, that's pretty good going uh, for, from a distance of five kilometers. Let's see if we can get a little bit more. Okay, a bit further out now. This would probably be eight to 10 kilometers. I'm not quite sure, but I'm in a uh, car park in Baronia and uh, got all the equipment set up and pointing towards Mount Dandenong. Uh, let's see how it goes. Well, believe it or not, we've actually improved our signal strength, which is now about minus 73 dB. It's probably because the antenna up on Mount Dandenong is directional, and I was probably just off to the side of it a little bit, and uh, perhaps I'm a little bit more uh, centrally located now. But the bottom line is I've actually got a stronger signal, and so uh, probably we'll get a, a better result if I run my speed test again. Okay, here's the results. A download speed of 954 kilobits per second, an upload speed of 161 kilobits per second, and a ping of 106 milliseconds, which is a bit more than before, but uh, still quite usable. Well, my EPC battery is getting a little bit flat, so I'm going to have to come back tomorrow, but so far so good. Uh, we've got, I think, probably 8 to 10 kilometers, and uh, still getting uh, quite good speeds. Okay, it's day two of Cantenna testing, and I've come out here to uh, Caribbean Gardens, which is a local park, and uh, we're about, oh, I guess, 12 kilometres southwest of Mount Dandenong. Let's see how the Cantenna performs. And there we are, uh, somewhere between minus 83 and minus 85 dB. So with the further distance, the signal strength has dropped back a bit, but it's probably still usable. We'll uh, connect and see if we can, uh, you know, transfer some data. Well, I've run a, another speed test, and I've come up with 1.28 megabits per second, equivalent to a download speed of 159 kilobytes per second. Still very usable, and certainly a lot better than dial-up. Uh, I won't bother with the upload test because I think that's throttled uh, through Melbourne Wireless anyway. But uh, it's a pretty good result, and I think I'm probably about 15 k's out, but we'll measure that when we get home. For one final try, I've come to Wheeler's Hill, which is a few kilometres out further. Unfortunately, I'm finding that the signal strength is about minus 93 dB, which just isn't strong enough to connect into the network. But the antenna's performed pretty well, so I'm pretty happy. So there you have it, the Australian Cantenna, quick and easy to build and capable of at least 14 kilometres line of sight.
That was a, a nice looking cantina, wasn't it, Jim? It really was. We got to get busy. Yeah, we've yeah. got to we got to up our game now. We got to <laughs> we got to pull the U.S. version out of uh, uh, mothballs and, uh, and start drinking grape juice. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot better than eating dog food. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, that's a good one, Peter. Great job. Well, back to uh, our next email here, and this came from, who did this come from, Jim? Was this it came Ed? from Ed, K-D-5-D-P-K. And Ed is wondering where he can put up a tower and a vertical antenna at his house. Here's a layout of his property that he sent. And it's a great question. Where and would you say, Jim? It's a tough question. I, I tell you, I've got my diagram here that I'm going to look and reference. And it has um, perhaps just a little ambiguity. I, I didn't really understand if you wanted to put up a tower and put the vertical on top of the tower or put up two separate structures, one tower, one vertical. We're going to go with the latter assumption. For the uh, tower, I would put it up between the two trees that are close to each other. That's where I would put the tower. And then the vertical that's really, really, really a hard call. Um, I know that, that, that Mama may not like it, but I would put it out from the other tree uh, kind of equally in the middle of the triangle created by the uh, cable TV coax and the wire that goes uh, from that corner over to the house. So what about that power line you're saying right there? Yeah. Under uh, the power e line? Equally in the middle of the okay. triangle created by the power line and the coax and the house. Okay, right about there. Yeah, it's, it's really, really hard to say. I, I would probably not put up a vertical. It would probably be my solution. <laughs> <laughs> Well, one of, the, one of the considerations will be, I think, um, all that noise coming from various sources, you probably need to uh, do a survey of the site and kind of work out where the lowest interference or noise is so that you've actually got um, uh, the best reception conditions. Good yeah, point, I, Peter. Yeah, good point. I think I would, uh, if I <clears throat> just had to have both of them. Yes. I, I think I would put the uh, vertical over here where you had said, Jim, I believe you said between the, the two trees. Yeah. Yep. Uh, that's where I think I'd put the vertical and the tower. And you should never put a tower near a power line. Yes. But if you went out and looked on the side of my house, <laughs> <laughs> you would find my tower is probably about right here at the side of the house and the power line is not too terribly far away. That, Right. Could lead to dangerous consequences, so I, I can't recommend <clears throat> that. Yeah, I understand. But, yeah. but that's where mine is. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, if you uh, you could put them both in, in our most coveted spot uh, between the two trees if you put the vertical on top of your tower. Yes, you could. <laughs> <laughs> what do you think, Tommy? Well, I'm, I'm going to go a whole different route from you guys. <clears throat> Maybe I don't totally understand, but I was thinking about putting it here. This looks like the eve of the Put house, the peak of the house, the tower. Right there okay. in the uh, entry and to possibly, the living room? Is that the entry to the <laughs> I, living room? I don't room? know. It could be. <laughs> well, it doesn't look like the, I was assuming this probably is the front of the house, because, yeah, this is the way it's like. He says he's got his ham shack right there, <clears> so it's probably not so the So I was thinking room. this is probably the what? back. The, the ham shack's not in the very front of the house. <laughs> I know it should be. Well, should yeah. be. What a strange layout, right? If yeah. it's not. Yeah. It's in the living room, right? Like ours? Uh, yeah, right, right yeah. So, so right there. Well, that's what I was thinking. But, you know, without actually really seeing the property, it's hard to tell. It's so but, hard to but, say. But, you know, yeah. we anchored yours. We secured yours partly to the top of the house. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, and you then can, he could actually attach his folded dipole actually off of that as well. Yeah, and you can, if it's Rome 25, you can buy a house mount that mm. mounts to the tower and is designed to mount to the house. And by the way, I'll be selling one of those yeah. at the Ham Fest. So it looks year. like we're going to have to come out to Ed's <laughs> house out there and take a, a look at the real so, deal. Yeah. So yeah, you're we'll not going to uh, give him a vertical? Oh, yeah. Where are you going to put his vertical up now? Well, actually, I thought uh, the vertical 
Is he, I don't know. Is he not going to put the vertical on top of the tower? Probably yeah. not. He's probably going to put a tri-bander or something We're up there, sure. I would think. But yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, don't get a vertical edge because <laughs> uh, I don't know where for you to put it. <laughs> That's an easy way out of that. Yeah. Well, this time around, um, I had a couple of ICOM radios here in the shack. <clears throat> oh, yes, you did. See yeah. them over there, and I see 718, and I see my shack next week. 7200. So, well, if you, if you close your eyes be, when I'm leaving, <laughs> yeah, they'll probably be in somebody else's shack, but uh, probably won't be yours or mine. <laughs> The IC718 is ICOM's popular entry-level rig. It has all the features that you would expect in a rig of this class. Of course, all rigs have a volume control, RF gain, and a squelch. The IC718 also has a RIT control that's helpful for tuning in those stations that are just a little bit off frequency. There's also a shift control that'll help eliminate some adjacent interference. The 718 is an all-mode rig, with the exception of FM. It does not cover the FM mode. There's optional DSP filters available for the rig, and those seem to help. Of course, memory, and there's a noise blanker, and audio compressor, as you would expect in most rigs. There's also preamp, attenuator, controls for an optional auto-tuner, and other features. Options on this rig include crystal filters, DSP, and others. Looking at the rear of the unit, we see all the usual suspects. Of course, an antenna jack, ground connection, power connector, connector for an optional auto tuner, send and ALC lines to connect to an optional linear amplifier, a jack for a CW key, the accessory connector, an external speaker jack, and a remote control jack that may be used with an optional serial level interface. The IC718 offers good performance in an economical rig with features like wide dynamic range, a high signal to noise ratio, and full duty operation. The 718 is a practical rig at a good price. The thing I like most about the ICOM IC7200 HF and 6 meter transceiver is its rugged looks. I mean, this thing looks like a piece of military gear. It's very well constructed. You can even get an optional pair of rack mount style handles that fit on the sides and also help protect the front of the rig. If you need a rig you can take out for mobile or portable operations like field day or emergency communications, the IC7200 might just fit the bill. The radio has all the normal features like a volume and RF gain and squelch control, and there's quick access to the memory channels as well as the program settings through special keys here. And there's also a twin passband tuning control that can be very handy for eliminating interference on adjacent channels. The IC7200 is an all-mode radio with the exception of FM. ICOM decided to leave out the FM on this radio since it's not that frequently used, thereby allowing for a sharper first IF in the radio to help sensitivity and selectivity. The radio also includes a speech button that will give us some quick parameters. S9 3.77 MHz LSB. The bandwidth filtering allows you to have three separate settings, a wide, a medium, and a narrow. Holding down on the button engages the filter settings, where you can choose a filter width anywhere from 3600 down to 50 Hz. I usually like to run my wide bandwidth filter on 3000 Hz. The medium bandwidth filter is set to 2400 Hz, of course, we can adjust that if we want to, but 24 sounds about right to me. The low bandwidth filter, or narrow, is set to 1800 Hz, and that's a good uh, bandwidth to choose, especially if you're expecting stations 2 kHz away. The IC7200 has a number of noise reducers, of course the noise blanker that most rigs have, but also the DSP noise reduction, which seems to be pretty effective on this rig and can really help cut down background noise. For IC718 radios, there is a DSP option available. There's also an automatic notch filter to get rid of that whistle when somebody's tuning up next to you. In addition to a number of other features on the radio, there's also an AGC button 
that allows you to choose between medium and fast AGC speeds. There's twin pass band tuning and a number of other features on the radio. Unfortunately, we just don't have time to cover them all here. On the rear of the unit, the first thing we notice is the heavy cast aluminum construction. There's corners on either side to help protect the heat sink and the connectors. And there's a fairly large heat sink on this rig as well. There's the normal connectors you'd expect, the antenna, a ground connection, a power connector. Now, this one is slightly different than most power connectors. And there's the plug for the optional auto tuner. There's also an accessory connector, a jack to plug a code key in, the connectors necessary for an optional linear amplifier, a remote connector, and an external speaker jack. But the connector that sets this rig apart from most others is the USB connector. This allows you to do remote control and data modes with this radio without requiring an optional audio interface. Both data and audio are transferred over the USB connector. Aside from its good looks, the IC7200 has all the normal features you'd expect on a rig of this cost, as well as DSP features. It can operate on DC voltages down to 11.7, which is a little unusual, and it has the USB remote control and data. So as I mentioned, that IC7200 has a USB port on it that can be used for remote control and data. And also sends the audio all through that one connector. And that's, that's pretty neat stuff. So we had to try that out. Tommy gave us a hand here. He uh, installed the software on his computer. Yeah, that was fun, man. It was really nice. I, I was just amazed at how responsive it was. You could, you could take that mouse and scroll and, and tune that radio and hear it. It sounded like... 100% real time. Yeah. It was, it was so fast. You sounded good on my end. I was surprised at the audio response. I mean, the, yeah, it, it was, was really good, and I was uh, very curious about where your microphone was and what the audio chain was before it, it hit RF and hit me. It, and the, the, uh, the software was a little bit odd to, to get set up, but once I, I understood where to go to set things up, it, it, start, it makes sense. But I wasn't quite as intuitive as I'd like, but Just it, had it was think very, very it. functional. Yeah, well, let's yeah. take a look at it. George has got a nice new ICOM 7200 sitting over at his place. I've still got my trusty Yesu that I've had forever, but I do have uh, the rem remote control software installed here to actually use the rig that's over there. So I've uh, already installed this earlier and pre-configured it with the IP address. It wasn't too hard to, uh, to set up once I figured out where to go and where to connect. So there's the uh, remote control software for the radio. This is the utility that actually initiates the connection. So let's go over here. It's already connecting. And we'll go over here and connect to the radio itself. So we made the connection to, to George's computer. And now we're making the connection from the computer to the radio so we can control it. And We've got audio, so that tells me right there we're good to go. So let's get this out of the way. And this software is very nice. There's a lot of functionality built in. You can transmit, use a regular microphone hooked up to your computer, and uh, it's just like sitting there. And the, the response, or the latency time is really, really low. It's, it's quite impressive. So let's connect to the radio and see what we've got going. So, okay, so the radio sitting over there is on 3954. So we'll turn around and see if we can find a QSO going on and see how it sounds. To control the rig, you just put the mouse over one of the knobs and left click or right click to rotate the knob. So let's... Uh, well, <clears throat> I think they're on. Well, we've got someone. And he sounds good. And we've got uh, the button for the tuner here. Um, 
preamp and attenuator, automatic gain control, noise blanker, noise reduction. They're both turned on. Let's turn them off. Let's turn on the noise reduction and see what difference it makes. That cleaned up pretty nice. Turn both of them on. Got some Tweeties on the nearby channel, but uh, it, it cleaned it up, cleaned the noise up quite nicely. Well, let's give this thing a try and see how it sounds. In five SPE, in five ZNO, you on the channel, Jeff? Hey, 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 or should I say, ho, 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 yeah, you know I am calling me on one of my favorite frequencies, over. Roger. Well, this is mighty good coincidence to find you on here this evening since I need to make a, a quick contact. I'm uh, trying this remote control for the IC2700 over, I'm sorry, IC7200 over at George's place. And I'm controlling it through the internet. How's it sound? Wow. Uh, impressive. Uh, that's amazing. Yeah, it sounded... Sounds great. I've got uh, arm chair copy on you, 100% five by nine. So that's a good deal. And yeah, I, I'm aware that the 7200 had that capability, but this is my first experience talking to one in that uh, mode. Yeah, Roger. It's amazing how responsive it is when uh, when you change frequencies. You can actually hear it change uh, pretty well immediately when you click the mouse. It's uh, it's pretty impressive. It was a little bit difficult to set the software up initially, but uh, I'm kind of liking it. Well, I've got a S9 plus noise level here, and you are 25 and 30 over, so you're well above the noise now. Yeah, you're about the same here. Um, about the same signal strength. Sounds good. Sounds pretty good. I tell you, you still got a little bit of RF in your audio you've been working on, so um, just let them know that's not the, the software for the rig here. That's uh, something, uh, artifact from the shack uh, rearrangement, a remodel job over there. Roger? Oh, yeah, QSL. Oh, okay, you're shooting this for amateur logic. Yeah, I just moved my shack. We're doing the ham shack, and uh, I've got some ladder line on the roof. Uh, yes, I did just move my ham station, so you know how that goes. Everything changes. Over. Yeah, Roger. I'm uh, about to move mine to another room, and uh, I'm gonna have to do some work on the on the uh, RF situation myself. I'm gonna build a choke and uh, put it up there on top of my mast, hopefully. Get a little time. So man, this uh, this software is pretty nice on here. Um, you can control pretty much everything on the rig. It's customizable for several different the ICOM rigs. Well, man, I appreciate the quick uh, QSO. I just want to try this thing out, and uh, anyway. I wouldn't mind having one of these for when I'm traveling. It'd be nice to have on my laptop. Anyway, I appreciate it, man. Let me go ahead and clear with you, and it's getting kind of late here, and uh, I'll catch you probably tomorrow on the ride in. N5ZNO. Sounds good. Enjoy it. Zulu, have a good one. N5ZNO, N5SPE, and N5SPE. So, yeah, once again, I have to say the audio was Excellent, considering that it was remotely controlled and transmitted. What were you using for uh, your microphone there on that end? Oh, you're going to laugh, man. A $9 Walmart lab mic, disc mic. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that's incredible. You know, it, I like the radio, and I've never even seen it. When we get finished shooting, I'm going to have to turn around here and check it out because uh, I've used it now a couple of times and yeah. I've never even looked at it. Yeah, we, we should let uh, Peter operate it from down under there and... Uh, Wow. Make some good That'd be fun, actually. Oh, yeah. That would work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nothing, nothing uh, different from what we actually did. Well, on the page of strange and unusual things, yes, we got some pictures here. Oh, this is my favorite part. And these came <laughs> from who sent us these? K I four Y O B. Doug. Douglas. And uh, I talked to him. Was it on the air? Y-O-B. Does that stand remember. for your own 
backyard or something? Only do this your in your own, own backyard? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's BYOB. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> well, you, anyway. I'm not I, saying anything that that, that that applies in any way to Doug, but boy, these pictures look like someone may have. <laughs> yeah, I think I talked to Doug on the air one night. We just stumbled across each other, and uh, he got to tell me about his antennas and, and sent some pictures here. I, I can I, tell you right now, Doug's wife is really mad at him. <laughs> yeah. And Saturday morning when his kids get up, they're not going to be happy either when they can't ride their bicycles. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> this first one, yeah, I've got a comment I've got to make about it. That, that antenna literally has everything and the kitchen sink thrown in. <laughs> it sure does. <laughs> and if you, you've heard people talk about 50 kilowatt radio stations vibrating the bed springs yeah well <laughs> there you may, go. maybe doug was on to something with that oh i think actually he said it didn't work too good <laughs> <laughs> oh oh you never know yeah antenna number know. two here uh would be hard to identify exactly what that is it looks to me like an iv hanging off of uh, <laughs> a pole but yeah it is uh I don't have quite as much to say about that one. It's it's kind of hard to make them. out exactly what yeah. the shape is. I think that is uh, split handlebars, and, and maybe that's maybe. a one one yeah. ballon hanging down yeah. there below it. Yeah, it's hard to say. Yeah, but the next one is quite clear. Uh, yeah, and uh, what is that, Jim? Handlebars, I would say. And you, you're, um, I guess you're more or less um, omni with that type of arrangement. But on the last one here, Tommy, what what do you think about this one? Yeah, that's interesting. I can't tell. <laughs> it, it looks like two pairs of handlebars. Kind of, yeah. sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Making a set of beams out yeah. of it. That's cool, man. Yeah, he's got a, a rotor up under there. So. Yeah, so you uh, can turn that. You'll have guys that'll tell you, ah, don't bother. Just go get you some modeling software and uh, put it in there, and you'll be able to tell what it's going to do. And there's a, maybe a little bit to that, but the bottom line is, is you don't ever really know till you hook it up. You know, you got to hand it to Doug, though. I guess, I'm assuming he's the one that actually did this. this he, stuff. He's it's got really, the right. It's ID, impressive, man. Hams, they are, say. hams are experimenters, yeah. but I mean, by yeah. nature, that might throw and, and Peter that's right on target. That's cool stuff. Peter, uh, the ID uh, down here in the extreme south, we <coughs> say you have to really get the ID of something. Well, Tommy and I don't really say that. It's just <laughs> no, yeah. only on that side of the room. <laughs> Let's wrap this up and uh, send 2011 home. Okay, well, yes. If you're going to do anything this year, you better hurry. Better get on it. You better get on with it, yeah. And uh, speaking of which, I need to get out and do some antenna work right now, so... I think in your last oh. segment, you were talking about yeah. doing some antenna work. There is one last thing we've got to do for the Christmas segment. We've got to, you know, go through what is it that you hope Santa will bring you, ham radio related. And, and what is it you want, Jim? Well, it depends on if we're talking realistically what Santa can bring or what in theory. I'm going with in theory what I would really most like for Santa to bring. And I think right now what I would most like is an Elecraft K3. Okay, well... If Tommy and I are Santa, you don't have to worry about that. <laughs> yeah, that, that won't be coming. <laughs> I hope Santa that works at Elecraft is listening. <laughs> <laughs> what would you like, Tommy? Man, you know, honestly, I'd like to have another rig for the house, but mostly I think I really want to get a decent HF antenna for my truck. More um, than a... More than I a, think so. Yeah. Well, Anything particular in mind? I or just already in gave you HF antenna for the truck last time you were over here. So yeah, I'm still, ride, I'm still riding it around. <laughs> yeah, I know. You're going to have to mount that thing. It's still laying on the back seat where it was when I left here with it. <laughs> and what do I want? Yes, what do you want? I haven't really even given it a thought. Um, I know one thing I've got to have, and that's another uh, dual band uh, VHF UHF antenna for one of my vehicles. Yes. Got to have that. But, that always. Uh, you Makes know, a nice one. I really don't know what I would like to have. Uh, I'd like to play with one of those flex radios, though. I, I ah, think that could be a lot of fun. The truth comes out. 
Well, I'm actually going to get my, uh, ho- hopefully my uh, my present uh, early next year, not not at Christmas. Um, I'm putting an extension on the house and uh, I'm getting my own ham shack room. So you'll ne- early in the new year, either the first episode or the second episode, you'll see an entirely new set from me um, and uh, hopefully a quite interesting one upstairs uh, in the new room. Um, in the uh, As for non-ham uh, radio-related stuff, um, tomorrow night is the big, much-awaited derby between Melbourne Heart and Melbourne Victory, and I'm hoping for a win for the Melbourne Heart there. So the guy who lives <laughs> furthest from the North Pole is going to get what he wants, and we're just all left out here. <laughs> yeah, Santa going... Phew. <laughs> Making that long in run first. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, with uh, actually with uh if I don't know if you've ever heard the song Six White Boomers by uh Rolf Harris, but uh go have a listen to that. Uh with six kangaroos pulling the sled. Okay, yeah. uh, that's yeah. uh, <laughs> I like I, that. <laughs> I prefer chipmunks roasting in an open fire. That, that was always my favorite Christmas carol. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Happy New Year. Oh. Don't drink and drive. Hey, 7-3. That's right.